gospel lesson. It's good news according to Matthew, the 18th chapter. We're on page 24 in the New Testament portion of your pew Bible. Matthew chapter 18, beginning at verse 21, where the subheading reads, Forgiveness. Then Peter came to Jesus and said, Lord, if another member of the church, and you'll notice in the footnote it says, if a brother sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, not seven times, but I tell you, 77 times. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he began the reckoning, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. And as he could not pay, his Lord ordered him to be sold together with his wife and children and all his possessions and payment to be made. So the slave fell on his knees before him saying, have patience with me and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the Lord of that slave released him and forgave him the debt. But that same slave, as he went out, came upon one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him by the throat, he said, pay what you owe. Then his fellow slave fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me and I will pay you. But he refused. Then he went and threw him into prison until he would pay the debt. When his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their Lord all that had taken place. Then his Lord summoned him and said to him, You wicked slave! I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have had mercy on your fellow slave as I had mercy on you? And in anger... His Lord handed him over to be tortured until he would pay his entire debt. So my heavenly Father will also do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother or sister from your heart. The Gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Lord, teach us again this day what it means to forgive as we have been forgiven. In your name we pray. Amen. Alexander Pope was a poet who is credited with the quotation, to err is human, to forgive divine, which in unpoetic language might be translated, people will mess up big time. That's easy but it's super hard to forgive someone unless you're God. Well, the theme of today's lessons, all four of them clearly, is centered around forgiveness. I'd like to talk mostly about Genesis and then our story from Matthew. Candy read for us the very end of the story of Joseph, but I wanted to remind you of the whole story and our Sunday school children also focused on this story today. This story, if you go back and read in Genesis, is like the outline of a huge novel, a saga, maybe written by Charles Dickens or James Michener. You may remember how the story begins, that Joseph is one of 12 brothers. Their father, Jacob, has 12 sons and Joseph is his favorite, and he doesn't ever try to hide the fact that Joseph is his favorite. <clears throat> we could stop here for a moment and talk about all of the dangers of having a favorite child over the other children in a family, but that's not the point. Remember that it was Jacob who gave Joseph a brand new Columbia ski jacket of many colors. Do you remember that part of the story? When I was in Sunday school, in vacation Bible school, we always had the Joseph that was plain white, standing there like this. And you had to either get out your crayons and color a coat of many colors or cut out strips of paper or cloth. A nice little craft project to help point out the fact that he had this beautiful robe, this beautiful coat. 
We don't do that in adult education as much, but maybe we ought to have craft time sometimes for adults too. Anyway, we would do that, and then I don't ever remember hearing the rest of the story, the rest of the sordid and dark details of the story, the intriguing stuff that really, really makes you think. Jacob treated Joseph as his favorite. That made the rest of the brothers hate him. And not only did they hate him because their father treated him as a favorite, but because Joseph was kind of an arrogant brother, a big-headed brother. He thought he was better than the rest of them. At least that's how they understood it. They would have dreams, and they'd talk about their dreams, and he would interpret their dreams, and every single time, he was the champion. Even though ten of the brothers were older than he was, they thought he was too big for his britches because he was always the one who came out on top. In fact, they hated him so much that they came up with a plan to get rid of him. One day, while they were all out watching the sheep, they came up with the idea that they would take his coat of many colors and they would kill a lamb and put lamb's blood on it, get rid of Joseph, and they would tell their dad, Jacob, that he had been killed by a lion. And they throw Joseph into a pit and they get his robe all full of blood. And then a caravan shows up. And so instead of just killing Joseph or leaving him in the pit to suffer and die, they decide to sell him into slavery. Do you remember this story? And he is taken by the caravan down to Egypt. That's where Joseph ends up. And the brothers go home and they tell their dad that he's dead. While Joseph is in Egypt, His gift for being able to interpret dreams comes in handy as the king, the pharaoh, is having dreams that he doesn't understand and nobody is able to interpret his dreams for him. And Joseph is able to tell him, well, there are going to be some great years where all of the crops and the animals produce a huge amount of surplus, and that's going to be followed by some awful years where we're not going to have enough. And so Joseph is put in charge of planning for the future and storing up the extra so that when the time of the lean bad years come, there will be enough. And sure enough, that is exactly what happens. And during the time when things are bad, that happens all over, not just in Egypt, but all over the area And back in Joseph's homeland, his brothers and his father are all hurting. There is a horrible drought. And they've heard that down in Egypt, there's plenty, that there's extra. And so Jacob sends his sons on a journey down to Egypt to see if they can get help. When they arrive, Joseph meets them, but they don't know that it is Joseph. They don't recognize him now that he's dressed and as an Egyptian, although he recognizes them right away. And you would think that this would be the time for a great big payback. Joseph's heart is torn on what to do, and he decides that what he's going to do is get his younger brother to stay there with him without revealing who he is. And so he frames him. He sets him up. They put a silver cup in his bag along with the grain that they're sending back to help. And he sends soldiers after them to capture him and to say he stole that from Pharaoh and now he has to go to prison. You may remember what happens is the older brothers decide they can't go back for a second time and tell their dad they lost another brother. And they come back and they plead with Joseph for mercy. And he reveals who he is. And they're scared to death. What we get today is the very end of the story. Where their father Jacob dies. And now they're really worried that they're going to get it. That he's going to pay him back. 
And he says something absolutely amazing, something almost divine. Am I God? Am I in the place of judgment over you? What you intended for evil, God intended for good. It's an amazing story. Now I want to pause here for just a moment. Pastor Amy mentioned this last week, and I completely agree with her. When we're talking about forgiveness, this does not mean that it's okay for somebody to abuse somebody else or that we ought to remain silent if we're the victim of abuse. That's not what this point of forgiveness is about. But here is an important lesson. God is judge, not us. So we need to let God be God. And secondly, when we offer the gift of forgiveness, when we're into preserving the relationship, even though like when I had the issue with my brother and the bike riding being ditched, forgiveness is important to restore a relationship if the relationship can be restored. So forgiveness is a very powerful thing. It's easier in some ways to maintain a grudge than it is to give true forgiveness. Let's transition to the gospel as another glimpse of forgiveness. 10,000 talents. That's crazy money. One talent was equal to 15 years of wages for a worker. 15 years. Do the math. One talent, 15 years, 10,000 talents. We're talking millions and millions of dollars here in today's money. In contrast to that, one denarii was the pay for one day. So if you worked 365 days a year, you'd get 365 denarii. A hundred denarii, therefore, is less than a third of a year's wages. Still a lot of money. It's not like it's just five bucks. But it's a manageable debt. It's something that could be worked off over time. It's something that could be paid back. So that's the point of the story. This incredible amount of money, 10,000 talents, and this little bit, a hundred denarii. It's this vast gap that's the issue, and the same person who's forgiven the 10,000 talents who then takes to task his fellow slave for owing him only 100. It begs the question as we think about this, what king in his right mind would ever let a slave accrue 10,000 talents worth of debt? What king would do that? Oh, wait. Maybe there's one. One God who's always generous. One God who's always ready to forgive. One God who's always trying to love us back into a life worth living and into a relationship with that God. One God who loves us so much that he would pay an enormous price of dying on the cross for us so that we might know our sins are forgiven, that our debt has been paid. We're so happy to come here to church, to stand up and to say we believe in this God and in his love for us and what he's done for us. But far too often we forget that he has paid a price that's millions and millions of dollars, and we are far too quick to be a judge of our fellow human being, far too quick to hold a grudge and to not forgive, far too quick to hold on to these things. This is the mirror that's held up before us today. We have to ask ourselves the question, who is it that we need to forgive that we're holding on to? Or are we someone 
who needs to go and ask forgiveness from a fellow brother or sister that we have hurt. Jesus paid an enormous price. Are, willing, are, are we willing to be generous as he is generous, merciful as he is merciful? I thought it'd be helpful for us today to end my sermon by having an opportunity for a time of confession and forgiveness. So I'd like to invite you to take out your red hymnal and turn to the front section to page 238. 238. Corporate Confession and Forgiveness. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, God promises to heal us and forgive us, let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal, have mercy on us. For self-centered living and for failing to walk with humility and gentleness. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal, have mercy on us. For longing to have what is not ours and for hearts that are not at rest with ourselves. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal, have mercy on us. For misuse of human relationships and for unwillingness to see the image of God in others. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal, have mercy on us. For jealousies that divide families and nations and for rivalries that create strife and warfare. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal, have mercy on us for reluctance in sharing the gifts of God and for carelessness with the fruits of creation. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal, have mercy on us for hurtful words that condemn and for angry deeds that harm. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal, have mercy on us for idleness in witnessing to Jesus Christ and for squandering the gifts of love and grace. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal, have mercy on us. God, who is rich in mercy, loved us even when we were dead in sin and made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. Almighty God, strengthen you with power through the Holy Spirit, that Christ may live in your hearts through faith. Amen.